uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Les Thompson from the Gold Coast Amateur Beekeepers Incorporated. So Les got into beekeeping in the early 1980s almost by accident. Les was a school teacher transferred around the state and at one location he discovered two white boxes tucked away in a back corner of the school and this led to the discovery of the amazing life that bees live and the sizeable contribution they make to our everyday living. So Les has moved to the Gold Coast around about 10 years ago and joined the Gold Coast Amateur Beekeepers Society to share this interest and passion of keeping bees. So thank you very much, Les. Thank you. Oh, thanks very much for your interest. Uh, I guess, <coughs> yes, we began accidentally. Uh, in, in Queensland, they used to have a thing called project clubs where kids would raise calves, grow sugar cane, or in my case, they had some beehives. And, uh, and I learned an awful lot from a few uh, old farmers who had the, uh, the practical knowledge the first time I uh, showed up to rob the hive, I uh, showered, no perfumes, no soap, dressed like the person there in the front, uh, full length white gear, and uh, the dad who was helping me showed up in a Jackie House singlet, having just gotten off his tractor, uh, ploughing for four hours that morning. So a lot of what you read in the textbooks is good, but uh, not necessarily what you need to do when you know your bees. That particular photo there is in an urban setting. Uh, the people have a bigger block of land uh, than the 600, but that's up um, up towards uh, Rabina, and you can see it's just a um, a little garden they've got out to the side of the house. Uh, one person appropriately dressed for robbing bees, uh, the other person being a little sillier um, with just a veil and uh, some other gear. As strange as it sounds, you get to know your hives and, and your hives do get to know you. Um, they'll, they'll put up with a fair bit so long as you're just calm, cool and collected. Um, certainly, keeping bees in the urban setting is uh, as easy as, as it is in the rural setting. Tweedshire Council, uh, they are only really interested in commercial beekeepers and uh, depending on the zoning of your land, around this part of the world, the zoning would be such that you can't keep bees commercially, which is over 50 or 60 hives. Most of us don't want to, so the council's quite happy for you to work with your neighbours. And the truth of the matter is, um, it's a complaint-based intervention by the council. Neighbours complain. Mm. If you live north of the border in the city of the Gold Coast, again, um, whilst they seem to be heading towards a ban the bee situation, currently it is uh, quite, uh, quite acceptable for you to have bees in, again, the urban setting. The small blocks, one, that are nor normal standard, uh, they'll tolerate two hives. And again, they put the stipulation on them. <coughs> you either join an incorporated, recognised beekeeping society or club, or you register with them. Um, I think, again, they make it far easier for you to join us than to fill out their application form. So uh, for $25 a year, um, you can join us and, and keep your hives. And uh, the beauty of the amateur beekeepers, as the name implies, uh, we do it for love more than anything else. And one of the things that we're certainly looking at doing is setting up mentoring processes for people who um, who are new to the game and we'll see you through the first season. Where do we point this? Oh, bit cutting. Um, New Zealand, hats off to them. Uh, not only do they play rugby well, but they do uh, coins exceptionally well. This is their new $1 coin. Uh, it's available if you have friends in New Zealand from Monday and uh, it is a truly spectacular recognition of the, the role that the Apis mellifera, the bee itself, plays in our, um, our society. Uh, New Zealand's most famous beekeeper, of course, is Sir Edmund, Edmund Hillary, and uh, they have done a wonderful thing with that new coin technology of the ceramics, and uh, it, it truly looks uh, beautiful on the screen, but. In real life, uh, it looks even better. It's fabulous. On sale from Monday. 
And without these, you can see what would disappear. And uh, honey is a byproduct. The bees, it's about the pollination. Um, uh, they, they, uh, they say there's what statistics, oh, lies, damn lies, and statistics. Uh, you will read that every one in three mouthfuls of food you consume is is dependent upon bees, and they ought to put the rider to some extent. Uh, your, your wheats, your rice, those grassy type things are more wind pollinated. So if you like your wheat mix and we lose the bees, you'll be as happy as Larry. If you want some of these things to go on your wheat mix, um, then we really do have a problem. Uh, not only will the honey disappear, but uh, certainly those other crops that you can see. And there's everything there from the, uh, I think, are they the grassiers, the cabbages and that sort of thing, right through to your watermelons, avocados, um, almonds. Um, we seem to get an awful lot of news around almonds and the uh, pollination that they need to get them going. It's a heavy, heavy demand pollination crop, the almonds, and it's only over a very short period of time. But uh, similarly for things like apples, uh, apples have a three or four week period where keepers move their hives in. Uh, they pray that the orchardist doesn't have occasion to spray and then after those three or four weeks the hives are moved out, the flowers are pollinated and the beauty of that is it then gives the orchardist a three or four week period at the end where they all come together and ripen rather than as you might have had in a, in a home country garden, you want your fruit to ripen over a long period of time, well the commercial growers want them in that three or four week period and uh, we can support them with the use of pollinators. The byproduct again is uh, honey, and that's uh, that's quite often how you can see the specified honey, uh, yellow box, um, avocado flavoured honey. Yeah, bit of an imagination because the bees do a good job of taking all those flavours out, but still you can often get the aromas. And I guess again, the main thing that uh, the amateur beekeepers are about is ensuring that uh, we, we manage to do what we can in, in our own backyard. And uh, we'll never match what the big pollinators, the blokes with a thousand hives and a bee double to move them can do. But certainly, again, we play a part in what happens. So there's your breakfast, thanks to the pollinating bees. And I should also give credit that it's not always the European honeybee. Australia has hundreds of native bee species. Um, interestingly, we have hundreds of native bee species. There's just a little bit short of a dozen that are stingless. All the others will sting you, but the beauty is uh, all the others are pretty solitary kind of bees. Um, there's about that dozen species that get together in a hive structure uh, and they're the small, and fortunately all of those are stingless. Um, I guess by way of example, out of a hive, a full production hive, which is the bottom box and two honey boxes, uh, you'll get about 100 kilos of honey a year, and that will leave the bees with about 100 kilos which they need for their own day-to-day uh, -day use. Um, out of a native beehive, uh, you probably get uh, 500 grams uh, and to get that you, you essentially have to destroy the hive. But without bees you're reduced to a pretty ordinary fare and just comparatively speaking Manuka honey a wonderful thing. Again, New Zealand and its marketing. Uh, Chinese gooseberries become kiwi fruit. And the Australian Leptospernum tree gives them New Zealand manuka honey. Uh, just uh, there's an awful lot of research going on around the world because we are faced with the superbugs in uh, bacteria and that sort of thing. Um, the old Roman barber surgeons had the idea that. Uh, 
for a reasonable sort of sword slash or lance piercing, you could pack it with honey, and uh, you know, probably two out of five survived uh, if you were a legionnaire, but certainly the Manuka honey is, uh, is the medicinal sort of uh, preferred way to go. And it does come from the Leptospermum. It's not a particularly attractive bush, uh, but it does flower. New Zealand has two species. They got them from Australia. Uh, we've still got about 78 others. We've got about 80 of them. Uh, very popular with main roads. If you know the Stewart Road off-ramp there at Corumban, uh, where you come off the M1, you'll see there at a certain time of the year, it's just thick with white flowers. And they're the uh, Leptospermum that uh, does the manuka. All honey does have some medicinal properties. You can see from the little table, right down the bottom, you've got table grade honey. And then when you start to get into the um, plantation Leptospermum, uh, the New Zealand stuff rates, according to the scientists, around at 550. And then uh, the Australian manuka honey, uh, and I'm not sure that we'll be able to call it that for much longer. They want to patent the name manuka. But uh, the Australian jelly bush honey uh, is up there at around 1750. What the research is, is seeming to, seemingly telling us is that the medicinal purpose, of, the medicinal properties of the honey uh, when it comes off the Leptospermum bushes improves enormously when the tree is in a harsh, dry environment. And that's Australia, that's not New Zealand. So um, certainly there's a lot of people doing research uh, in the universities and in the uh, associated uh, medicinal um, pharmaceutical area to see what we can do to redress the, the really worldwide um, preference people have for Manuka honey. Um, and it, whether you take it internally or whether you use it as, a, as an abrasion, uh, you can buy it. Uh, a bit reluctant in hospitals to use it. There's a medicinal bandages and that that are purpose built, purpose made. And uh, again, it, it just really fights those um, superbugs uh, or anything getting close to them. And the way it does it is it not only is an antibiotic, so it not only kills off um, what is damaging you, but it also promotes, it's a probiotic in that it promotes what's good in you. So you get the double whammy effect of being looked after, but then also uh, proactively moving towards better health. And I guess the 21st century of beekeeping is uh, Stuart and uh, Cedar Anderson's flow high. Uh, you certainly lived under a rock if you haven't heard of it before, uh, if you haven't seen it on Australian Story or, or any one of a thousand YouTube clips. Um, it is an absolute engineering masterpiece. This is one of the uh, frames that they use. Uh, that particular box there is uh, one of their Western Red Cedar boxes, which are just an absolutely beautiful piece of, um, piece of work. Uh, but it really is just a box with holes cut in it. This is, this, is, this is the bit that is important. You still need to be a beekeeper, and it pleases us as beekeepers to hear Stuart and Cedar say that. Um, if you want cheap honey, Woolworths. Can't beat them. But if you want to have a bit of fun, then you need to get into bees, and uh, you'll essentially have the bottom box the brood box, which will be similar to this. It's not anything to do with this. Uh, and it's where the queen works. Uh, she can live from three to five years. Uh, she lays 1,500 eggs a day when she's uh, in, in the mood in summer. Uh, she quietens off during winter, all these sorts of things. After three years, um, she's not really doing much. If you're a commercial keeper, you'd uh, kill her and requeen after every 12 months. As I said, we get three to five years, and we're happy with them. You have 10, 10 frames, which aren't like this, just 10 wooden frames. She works down there, 
that's where the nurse bees, when they hatch initially, they progress through. Uh, if you've seen the bee movie, it's not a bad depiction, excepting that the jocks should be jockettes. They're girls, not boys. Um, and they get out towards the end of their life. A queen, uh, a queen, as I said, three to five years. Um, a worker bee, about 21, 28 days. And uh, the drone, well, their life is dependent upon their usefulness. And uh, once a queen's mated, that varies. Um, they have a very precarious grip on life within a hive. Hives that have some drones seem to work better than hives where they remove all the drones. But really the drones are the males and uh, for the mating of a virgin queen, that's, that's really their only requirement. And then they, um, they just lead the good life and uh, eat up our girls' resources uh, when the girls tire of them out the front to the ants. Uh, or if, if it gets really harsh very quickly, uh, they'll have actually nip the head off the drone and uh, that's it. On the second box or the third box, uh, that's where you start using your um, flow frame, which is, as I said, a bit of an engineering marvel. It, the whole hive is tilted a little bit, not that much, but it's tilted so that the honey will drain to the back. And you can see there, that's the back of the hive where the little girl is. And that hive is not closed up, it's nothing. The bees are actually coming out the front there. Uh, she's standing behind it. Uh, you can see the big key at the top. So uh, you take a piece out of the top so you can see in. Uh, you take a bit out of the bottom there so you can pull a little plug out of the back. Put your stem in, put your bottle. And what you actually do then with the key, it starts off on the horizontal and the cells in the in the frame here are actually broken in the middle but the bees wax them up, fill them with honey, you pull down to where it is there and what that actually does is fractures the comb inside and if you have a look at this later you can see honey dribbles down, gets to the gutter, runs to the back and runs out and uh, Mum and Dad are probably sitting on the veranda watching their little girl. If I was doing that, I'd be an absolute lather of sweat on a mechanical extractor trying to spin the honey out of my frames. And uh, again, <coughs> credit to Stuart and uh, Cedar, they acknowledge it's the extracting the honey that they've beaten. They really have, it's fabulous. Um, and once you're finished, um, again, from the vertical up to the horizontal and they realign. Uh, all your bees are still in there. Uh, they're probably wondering what has just happened. Uh, but they're forgiving souls and they're back into it. They'll start to repair the fractures and uh, inside a couple of days, you can see they'll, they'll start filling the, um, the cells with honey or they fill it initially with uh, nectar they uh, semi-digest it and add enzymes and this to the nectar that they collect and then they put it in. They all get together in a group effort and uh, flap their wings, reduce the moisture content in the uh, nectar to under 20% and then it's honey. And uh, if you see on these here, they then cap it with a wax, uh, which again the bees produce from wax producing um, glands uh, underneath their uh, thorax there. And they cap it and uh, they've gotten honey out of the pyramids, which was edible. Uh, it's that, that probiotic, the, um, all honey has a certain a little bit of um, hydrogen peroxide in it, which again keeps the bacteria down. So if it's properly sealed, as I say, they've gotten edible honey out of the um, pyramids and it just lasts forever. Um, so that's that one. Uh, again, uh, you can see them. This, you can see on that one over there how they've got the white box at the bottom. Uh, that's more our traditional brood box, a Langstrom hive. 
hive, which has uh, probably got 10 wooden frames in it, and then they've got, um, that's a modified box that you can buy. They, uh, they quickly realised that lots of us have equipment that we're not going to put in the cupboard, so from selling the whole hive complete, they've now gone across to selling just, I can buy a top box with six of these in it. Uh, if I feel like getting the jigsaw out, I can just buy six of these and cut some holes in my own boxes and do that. Uh, and, it, and it is really, uh, as I say, the 21st century of beekeeping.